So far in this series, Where to Put Your Pieces, I've looked at some games by the English Grandmaster Michael Adams. Now I'd like to look at a couple of games by another of my favourite positional players, and that is Ulf Andersson. Swedish Grandmaster, one of the strongest players in the world in, well, let's say the late 70s, early 80s. Um, I, he, I think his style was a little bit too dry to ever seriously challenge for you know the, the world title, but nevertheless, in, in those years, he was um, you know a, a fixture in in the top tournaments. So I'd like to look at one of his games. Uh, I've always been a big fan of his. So this was played in Bilbao in 1987, and Anderson is black. And he's playing against the Spanish player Felix Iseta. It's a Queen's Gambit declined. Well, I'm always pleased to see that on the board, of course, one of my favourite openings with black. Anderson plays knight d7, which is a kind of waiting move, actually. You're waiting to see where this bishop develops. If it goes to f4, then there's the chance of well, after an exchange on c4 to play bishop d6 to exchange the bishop off straight away. Um, and you leave yourself the option of possibly playing the Cambridge Springs with queen a5 against bishop g5. In any case, Iseta exchanges on d5. So now we have queen's gambit declined exchange variation. So a very, very common variation. And you'll notice that the pawn structures are more or less fixed. Now, this is one of the prerequisites for peace manoeuvring. When pawn structures are fixed, then it's far easier to determine where your pieces belong. So white takes control over this diagonal. That's very important. These are very standard moves. There we are. So there is pressure on this diagonal, which black, whoops, misfired, which black has to deal with. Rookie eight, excellent move. In this position, where there's a semi-open file, this rook belongs on e8. It's remarkable how often this rook comes into play with some kind of tactic on the e-file. Not, I mean, I'm not talking about just when the king is in the middle of the board. Um, but also the rook may at some point come up to e6 and swing across the king side. Of course, this is in the long term, but rook e8 is a very important move for this variation. White castles king side. Now you can castle the queen side, that leads, leads the game into very different paths, but castles king side played. Now the standard move here is to play knight f8, absolutely typical for this variation. The knight sort of curls round sometimes comes to g6, sometimes comes to e6. It reminds me, well, if you think of the Spanish and white does exactly this, the knight just gets out of the way for the moment and makes way for the bishop as well, possibly to come to g4, possibly e6. But that's another story. Anderson played g6, slightly unusual move. Knight f8 is more popular, nevertheless, this has also been seen and is a very logical move. We'll see exactly why he's played like this in a second. So rook b1 is probably the most normal move here to start this so-called minority attack. But he said to play rook e1. Now, clearly when you play a move like rook a e1, then this sends a big signal to black of where you're going to play. So it's not such a flexible move, rookie one. Let's see how the game develops. So Anderson continues with his plan. This is the idea of g6, obviously closes this, this diagonal, so it means that this knight move, knight h5, is possible. Now because the knight comes to h5, it covers f4, so the bishop well, it shouldn't really retreat here. That will be hacked off very quickly. So white exchanges bishops. And now, how do you recapture? Well, queen e7 kind of invites e4. If there's a rook on e1, 
sitting opposite the queen, then it's very natural to blast open the position with e4. And because black is slightly undeveloped, um, the undeveloped sounds like a zombie film, doesn't it? Um, then white obviously has some initiative. So the most sensible move here is to play rook takes. And actually the rook can be quite useful on this square. Now, what does white do next? Well, e4 doesn't really get you very far here after the trades and the, the knight can come to f6. Um, and actually black is pretty well organized there. So instead of goes back to, to uh, this minority attack plan. Of course, he's not committed to playing b5, but okay, it's a useful move to have anyway. Knight f6. So Anderson starts the task of bringing this bishop into play. And now, I think an, a normal move here would be to play b5, even though the rook is on this side of the board. Um, I think this is reasonable. And so black has this dilemma of how to deal with this tack. Do you al simply allow the pawn to stand on c6? Well, you could. But in this case, I think it's not bad to take because white's pieces aren't really very well organized to attack on the queen side. And now after bishop takes, bishop f5, the bishop comes to this nice square. So bishop d3, and now the knight comes back here. So this knight is pretty well placed. It might come around to d6. But also here you can see the rook is well placed, protecting the pawn. And actually black is very well placed to double on the c file and hammer down on the knight on c3, which lacks pawn support. So although black has an isolated pawn here, in fact, because black's pieces are very harmoniously placed, he's absolutely fine in this position. So instead of playing b5, which, I mean, I think the position would be roughly level there, but still, uh, white chose to play knight e5, and I suppose if white is playing rook e1, then it's clear he wants to develop an initiative on the king side, but it's not clear what white is actually achieving with this move, as we'll see. Anderson continues with his plan, knight g7, so we can see another reason for playing g6, it gives the knight square on g7 and it simply wants to support that bishop coming out to f5. That is so often the problem piece in the queen's gambit declined and if this is exchanged off then black is usually fine. Now white has a bit of a dilemma. Could just advance on the queen side, that might be the most prudent. Um, is that a plate f4? Again, seems to be, uh, well, in, in keeping with White's aggressive placement of the rooks on the king's side. But actually, let's see how Anderson deals with this attack. Well, first of all, you could manoeuvre the knight round to d6 like this. In this case, I think white would be doing rather well, having pushed the pawn to f5, because it blocks the bishop in, and that means this rook is, for the moment, blocked in. And I think white's attack is, is pretty strong. Positionally, it makes a lot of sense as well. You can see that square is well covered, so it's not so easy to, to enter on e4 either. But Anderson's move is much better. Instead of knight f5, he played bishop f5. Very logical. So trading the bishops. And now the knight sits on d6, and you can see the massive difference. Now a knight can come into e4. So often the knight is such a good piece on d6 in the Queen's Gambit decline. There are, there are lots of classic games um, with this knight on d6. The one I have in mind is Bobotsov against Petrosian, uh, where Petrosian put a knight on d6 and won with a very nice kingside attack. I'll leave you to look that up yourself. Um, 
if f5 here, well, you can see the difference between this variation and the last one. Black would enter on e4. Actually, in this position, white's attack well, doesn't really go anywhere, not with that knight here. And the rook, once again, coming into play on e7, defending the f7 square, very useful indeed, actually. So let's come back here. Well, Iseta felt he had to keep going. Perhaps he does, but, um, well, the die are cast now. Knight e4. So black occupying the e4 square. And now having done that, then f6 is coming to drive away the knight and then black can start to use the e-file and that pawn could turn out to be weak. So that's why white plays g5. But then that means that this square is slightly weakened. So let's see what happens. Now, excellent move from Anderson. Of course, at some moment he might well be able to get some kind of counterattack on the king side, but a5 is a really nice move because he starts to put some pressure on white's queen side here. Clearly, a b5 is impossible that gets taken. Um, so, and this, well, I don't know the best way to capture. Let's let's recapture with the queen, but you can see there's already pressure here. So a3, but there's pressure already. And Anderson exchanges, so now he's got the a file to play with, with the rook. And queen e6, very sensible. So the queen is just reminding white that his king is a little bit drafty and this attack on the king's side could rebound very badly. So queen h2 covers some squares. Now queen f5, very safe move, just blockading that pawn, making sure that uh, there are no big surprises with f5. Also, the queen does look down here as well. You never know when there's some kind of tactic could emerge. Rook c1, so that prevents a knight hopping in here. And now it's surprising that Anderson didn't play rook a3 hitting this pawn. This looks very logical. Instead, he played h5. Um, so that gives the king an escape square. It's a very clever move. He's thinking about his king position, actually. It also means that white is unable to play h5 and, well, possibly h6 to, to cramp the king, which could be significant later on if white ever manages to break through to the back rank. So, typical Anderson, actually, he's very careful about his king. He thinks about that first before lunging in with this move. And I think white should play rook a1 here to counter on the a-file. Although, you know, I think after knight d6 and possibly coming around to c4, there's no doubt that black is better in this position. Anyway, after h5, white exchanged pawns or captured en passant. And the king came up to h7, but now, I mean, this looks very dubious indeed. White's pawns on the king side. I mean, this one will be cleaned up and then there are you know the nice lady pawn on h4. Rook a1 played takes and now as the g pawn has disappeared we can drive the knight away and king takes pawn. So positionally black is doing fantastically well on the king side. It, it, the, the game has completely turned. So how to make progress? Well, knight d6 looks like a good move because now finally black gets a hit at the pawn on e3 and knight c4 and now it's hopeless for white. King f2 
And after this move, white resigned. If rook takes knight, check. And black wins an exchange. Well, very, very easy win. Yep, I just love that game. And that knight manoeuvre round to d6 is is just key in this position and in so many variations of the queen's gambit declined uh, particularly the exchange variation and the knight often sits beautifully on that square you can see it controls so many key squares in that position so i mean i don't know whether to describe that as a, a great defensive game by anderson um What's clear is that he managed to control White's attack beautifully and then suddenly it, the game just turned round. Well, I'm going to take a look at another of Anderson's games uh, in the next video. Remember, if you want to see exactly when or get notification of when the next video is posted, then please do click on the subscribe button and remember to click on the bell and to check the box that says receive notifications. Thanks for watching.